How are you all this morning? Everybody's good. Everybody's good. We're almost recovered from last week's rally day. Whew, yeah. A few announcements. But yeehaw. Yeah, we still have the yeehaw sign up in front of the um, office. Going to see if anybody notices it. I shouldn't have said anything and just kind of let it sit there. Uh, we have concluded our 3510 food drive, and we did it. That mountain represents, that mountain and the cash that we have collected represents 3,667 items of food. Yay. So tomorrow, uh, we're actually going to be holding a press conference here at 1 o'clock. Y'all are welcome to come to that. Uh, Pastor Dawn has been making all kinds of phone calls. She's contacted principals of the schools where the food is going to go. So we'll have school representation. We'll have representative from Helping Hands here. And we know of at least one television station that's going to be here. So, And, and y'all are welcome to come to that. It'll be, it'll be a great celebration. And then sometime during the week, we're going to divvy this all up. It's going to be distributed to three schools in the community and Helping Hands Ministries to help them feed the hungry in our midst. So that is something to really be proud of um, and remembering that it's not just our effort but a collaborative effort that, that we have done with Christ United Methodist Church and First United Methodist Church as we were worshiping together through the summer. I also want to remind you that two weeks from today, um, we will not be holding worship here. It's the weekend of the conference annual meeting. The activities for conference annual meeting will be here on Saturday, but Sunday morning's worship is going to be in Fairfield. So we're, we're co-hosting with the Fairfield Church, and we thought it would be fun to do the worship service over there. So we'll be, we will not be worshiping here as a UCC congregation. You're invited to be part of the conference annual meeting worship at 10 o'clock at the Fairfield Church. We'd encourage you to carpool, so you can either carpool on your own or meet at the parking lot by the Burger King on Northwest Bypass. Um, I would suggest that you be prepared to leave from there no later than 9.15, so I'd say meet in that parking lot at 9 to get organized, but it might be just be helpful to organize whatever carpools you want ahead of time and then just leave from, from wherever works for you. If you are not interested or able to get to Fairfield and want to participate in the UCC service, we will be live streaming onto Facebook, so you can participate that way, and the recorded service will be on YouTube later on in the afternoon, usually by about 1 o'clock. It might be a little bit later than that. Or you can worship in person uh, with First United Methodist downtown at 9.30 or Christ United Methodist Church here at 11 o'clock. Lila has asked me to, oh, Lila, I, we, she was back there when I talked to her. Lila has asked me to announce that she is still taking uh, donated goods for another yard sale, garage sale, to raise funds for Maui relief. Um, so she's going to do that sometime in, in early October. So if you have any good used um, items that you want to donate to help Lila raise funds for for Maui, she is coordinating that through a friend of hers who's working with the, the school system on Maui to help those funds get to the places where they need to be. There's no overhead. So all of the money that is, is raised is going directly to the people who, who need them. Can we say how much you've raised so far? Over $7,000. Over $7,000. So yeah. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. What other announcements do we have to share this morning? Uh, Jan there's a sign-up sheet out on the round table by the um, elevator for, what are we calling them, Janet? Pumpkin Pals, Secret Pen Pals. The, the little note is on the sign-up sheet. So that sign-up sheet is for the kids, right? Kids and grown-ups. So if you're interested in being a pumpkin pa pal, pen pal, there's that sign-up sheet on that on that table out there, and there's a little bit of note, a little note about that. There's a note. Okay. 
Okay, so kids sixth grade and up are staying in church today. Kids fifth grade and younger are going to Sunday school. This is a new thing that we're doing. Uh, we're having, we'll eventually be having youth Sundays beginning in October on usually around the third Sunday of the month. Our older youth will be participating in some capacity in worship, so you're going to be seeing them helping with the ushering, maybe doing a reading or two, and then all of the kids, and then they'll be in worship on the first Sunday of the month when we have communion. So we're, we're hoping that this will kind of help incorporate the older kids as they, as they grow up a little bit more into the worship life of the, the full worship life of the congregation. Anything else this morning? For any yes, Karen. Yes, there's a planned giving workshop um, the Friday before conference annual meeting. So that's the 29th of September. It's, going, it's running from 11 to 4, 4 11 to 4. Um, Andrew Warner, who is a United Church of Christ generosity officer, will be facilitating that. It's all about planned giving, how you can look at your finances and be intentional about how you are planning to use those funds in the ways that you want to have them used, and primarily around the around issues of generosity and how you decide to to use your to use your finances your new wealth to support that which is important to you and we're hoping that part of that which is important to you is the church so i do you you do have to register for that i need to look and see if registration is closed registration technically for a conference annual meeting is closed we may still be able to slip people in for the um, stewardship workshop on that Friday. So, and I think there's been information about that in the newsletter, so you can go there or talk to me or Susan Siri about that. And if, if you're not registered, you want to attend, um, let me know because I know people and can get you, can we can get people registered. Anything else this morning? Well, my friends, I invite you to just kind of take those worries that you have brought with you today, those concerns, that um, to-do list that is nagging at you, your grocery list that you've been such, you've done such a good job putting together that grocery list so that when you go to the grocery store, you get only the stuff that's on your list and not the three-pound bag of M&Ms. But just take those things that would keep you from being fully present in this place and set them aside. Or if you'd like, hold them in your hands and, and hold that out to God and let God hold that for you for a moment. God wants to meet you here in this place at this time. And so I encourage you to be fully present so that there's nothing getting in the way of what God might be wanting to say to you to do with you in this time. Welcome to worship.
Good morning. Please rise in body or spirit to join me in the call to worship. Grateful hearts need no special season to offer thanks to God. God Abundant is its reason for praise. In the face of love's mysteries, given such bountiful expression, what gifts of praise have we? Many have been enough for praise. Our hands, our strength, our singing hearts. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Spirit of light, let your wisdom shine on us. Come into our hearts. Make us your new creation. Spirit of silence, make us aware of God's presence. Come into our hearts. Make us your new creation. Spirit of courage, dispel the fear in our hearts. Come into our hearts. Make us your new creation. Spirit of fire, inflame us with your love. Come to our hearts. Make us your new creation. Spirit of peace, help us be still and listen to the still small voice. Come into our hearts. Make us your new creation. Spirit of joy, Inspire us to proclaim the good news. Spirit of power, give us all your help and strength. Spirit of truth, guide us all in the way of Christ. Our hymn today is Guide Me, O My Great Redeemer, number 18 in the New Century Hymnal. Worshippers that are with us today to come on up. There's a few. How are you? Should we sit down? Let's have a seat. I'm gonna. I'll sit right here on the steps. <clears throat> okay. So, do any of you know? if your name has any special meaning to it? Hmm. Yes. (laughs) 
He named you Chase because he knew you were going to be the fastest runner. And, and are you? You're like the fastest runner in the room, and so your name is Chase, so he'd have to chase after you. Yeah. I think today you are going to be learning about a guy named Moses, right? Am I? Okay, good. We're on the same page, which is always a good thing. So have you ever heard of Moses before? No? Do you know anybody named Moses? You've heard of the name Moses. So Moses is a really important guy in the in the Bible stories, in the, in the Hebrew scripture part of the, the Bible stories, or sometimes we call that the um, Old Testament. What, Chase? In the stories of the world. And Moses, his name has a special meaning. What do you, what do you think Moses would mean? Is he like a, a mower? Does he mow the lawn like Moses? Uh, I don't know. What? He's a human. He is. So his name means one drawn from water. Wow. So I'm just, you know, so those of you who get to go to Sunday school today, be, be watching about why you think his name would be one who is drawn from water. Is that part of the lesson? Oh, all right. <laughs> the spirit is working. <laughs> And so you're going to be talking about, you're going to be learning today about when Jesus was really, or when Moses was really, really, really little. And that's all I'm going to say about that story. But Moses is involved in more than just the water when he was little. And this is what we're going to hear about in church today, too, is how Moses was involved with the water when he was older. And it had to do with helping people um, get to freedom. So kind of be watching for some of those. You don't go into that part of the story today, though. Okay. So those of you who are going to be in church, you have to listen to that part. Okay. And then I always think it's fun to find out what your name means. So maybe you can ask the adults in your life what your name means, and if they don't know, you can go and look it up on the internet. They can help you do that. Look up the meaning of your name and see what that might mean. And then write it down. So this is your homework. Write it down. Write down the meaning of your name and bring it back to me next week, okay? Can you all remember that? No, but okay, we'll work on it. Okay. So who's going to Sunday school today? Okay, there's a few going to Sunday school today, and some are staying here. What does your sister's name mean? It's a flower. A, a hermit? Okay. Okay, well, we're going to do more with names next week, so bring your names back if you, if you remember, and I'll try to remember who was here, too, and kind of do some of your homework for you. Yes, sir. You have what? You can memorize it. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. As you are, oh, we need to pray, don't we? Okay for all the food and for all of us. So let's put our hands together like this in our prayer. Dear God, thank you for the names we have been given. Help us remember that the best name we have is your child. Amen. Hey, so we're going to sing you off to Sunday school or back to your seats.
Last week, we heard the story of the Passover, the meal that was shared among the Israelites on the eve of their liberation from Egyptian enslavement. Today's reading tells about the next part of the story of their journey of becoming a people. Pharaoh releases them from bondage, and they begin their journey. But Pharaoh changes his mind and chases after them with his army. Let us hear what happens next, as it has been kept for us in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, verse 19 through 29. Listen to what the scripture is saying to the church. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground and waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into a panic. Their chariot wheels were clogged so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us free, flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. This is the church's story for today. May the blessing of God be added to what we have heard. Thank you, Lila. Well, let's just start with the hard part of this story, shall we? How do we reconcile a God of love and justice that we know through Jesus of Nazareth and some of us in our own lives with the God that is depicted in this story that would intentionally drown men and horses to save the lives of others? How do we make sense of this vindictive expression of God with the one that tells us to love our enemies? How do we keep this story as sacred while holding on to the one that tells us to turn the other cheek? Remember the sacred texts that we embrace in faith are not history texts. There is no archaeological evidence that such a disaster 
ever fell upon an army of chariots in that region. There's no skeletal or chariot remains that have been found in the Red Sea or along its shores. It's even supposed that the Israelites that fled Egypt seeking liberation from enslavement was just this small band and really not even worth Pharaoh's time to pursue. But it makes for such good storytelling, doesn't it? To include a complete destruction of your enemies. And when you're facing the deepest struggles and challenges of life, sometimes you need fantastic stories to carry you through. At the core of this story, it's a creation story. You, th you just thought there were two. There's tons of creation stories scattered throughout our scripture, and this is one of them. It's actually the continuation of Israel's creation story. It's a story about the beginning of an identity of a people. A people who found meaning and purpose and identity as those who a mighty creator God came to them in the midst of their deepest need. It's a story that emerged and took shape and significance at a time of utter chaos and disruption. Anybody ever been there? And these people reached back into the family stories of departure and testing and chaos. And in the midst of this story, they are reminded of a God who heard the cries for mercy, brought order into the midst of chaos, and protected them from the forces that threatened to destroy them. It's a story that carries a message of hope and calls for faith and trust. That even in the most chaotic, disruptive times of despair and fear, God will see the people through to the other side to safety, to liberation, to a land rich in that which gives life and doesn't take it away. This is a hard story to embrace because it seems to paint a picture of a vindictive God who chooses mercy for some over the destruction of others. Well, when you're faced with the times when it seems like the entire world is against you, it's helpful to turn to the stories of others who have been there. And as we do so, we must also be careful to not demonize those who seem to be against us and expect that God will just flat out obliterate them. It's not what Jesus would do. And it's apparently not what God did in actuality through history. God did not cause the Egyptian army and their horses to drown. So, now that we've got that out of the way, and planning not to perpetuate that myth about God, let's move on. Let's move on to thinking about baptism and the waters of baptism. When we do, when we observe the sacrament of baptism here, there's this, there's this long, and some people think it's too long, prayer that is often said at the time of baptism. And it goes into all of this stuff about, about how God has worked through the message of water throughout time. And it, and it goes like this. Before the world had shape and form, God's spirit moved over the waters. And out of the waters of the deep, God formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. 
In the time of Noah, God washed the earth with the waters of the flood, and the ark of salvation bore a new salvation. And in the time of Moses, God's people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the promised land. In the fullness of time, God sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb, was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan, became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, washed the feet of the disciples and sent them forth to baptize all the nations by water and the Holy Spirit. Water is known throughout our sacred texts as both life-giving and chaos-creating. When our ancestors in faith faced their times of greatest challenge, they knew those times as chaos. And water became the symbol of that chaos. Just think about any time that you have been around uncontrolled water. Every once in a while when we go out to put water in the horse's water tank, we'll just turn the hose on and then we think, yeah, we've got a few minutes. We can go do something else. And then we forget that we've left the hose running in the horse's water tank. I came back from, I think it was General Synod or I don't know, somewhere this summer, and I could tell that there had been a lot of water in the pasture. And I asked Greg, how long did you let the water run? Hours. It's chaotic. You can't contain it. It washes things away. It gets into your shoes and gets everything all wet. It erodes foundations. It destroys roads. It's chaos. Think about the stormy sea that rocked the boat and the disciples as they feared for their lives while Jesus slept. Jesus' response to their plea once he woke up is to calm the storm, calm the chaos of their lives. Think about the creation stories in Genesis 1, that, that ordered, structured account of creation where day one this happened, and day two this happened, and day three this happened, and it is good, and it is good, and it is good, and the message that it is good keeps repeated because the life of the people who first heard this story and shaped it into what it was was anything but good, and it was chaotic, and they needed to hear that the God that they wanted to love and that they knew loved them wanted their world to be ordered and not chaotic. And so the Spirit of God blows over the waters and the waters are separated. The chaos is brought into order. And just to make sure that the rest of creation wasn't going to go rogue, the waters of the heaven were separated as well. And then think about today's reading from Exodus and the waters of the sea that seemed to, to block the way to liberation. The waters of the sea were the barrier that was in the way of safety. Chaos. When the story tells of Moses raising his arms and parting the waters of the sea so the people could pass through them to safety. It's the same action of the spirit that separated the waters at the beginning of creation, put chaos into order so that life can emerge. It's the same action that Jesus did when he climbed into the front of the boat and raised his arms and called out, Peace, be still. It's the story of a power that bring forth order out of chaos power that is being called upon, leaned into, and sought after in times of deepest, deepest.
deepest uncertainty. So for us, what needs compel us to embrace the creative, saving, bring forth order out of chaos power of God that embraces us at our baptism to see us through life crisis, the shifting political and economic sands, aging, raising children, raising compassionate, mercy-loving, peace-seeking children in a culture that seems to want to put those Jesus qualities on the back burner, if not completely off the stove. When life is chaotic and depressive and enemies are real and life-taking, we need stories that tell us that we embrace a God who has the power to separate the chaos and hold it at bay until we can make our way through. What's that line in the 23rd Psalm? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Walking through the valley of the shadow of death seems like it's pretty chaotic to me. We embrace a God who has the compassion to take chaos and hold it back so we can catch our breath, find our way, and maybe even recognize some order in the chaos in the midst of it all. Now, <clears throat> I'm a bit of a realist that you may all know. And I realize that even this great power of God will not always keep chaos at bay. Remember once the Israelites got through the sea? It wasn't over for them. Then they entered into a 40-year trip through another kind of chaos. And God was still with them, leading them, sending manna and quail and having some water show up out of a rock every once in a while. And on the other side of those 40 years, there was more water. This time, it was the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant that went into the river that led to the parting of those waters so the people could cross once again through the chaos on dry land. God's work and presence in creation is not a one-and-done affair. It just keeps going. Because there always will be chaos and disruption. As people of faith, what we are called to do is to lean into and embrace the creative work of God that will find a way to hold the chaos at bay. The call for us is to continually find ways to lean into that bring forth order out of chaos power and then move forward into it. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of reflection um, is Crashing Waters at Creation. A little note about how you're going to read it in the New Century Hymnal. It's number 326. So there's, there's two hymns on this page. The words that we're going to be singing are just the words printed on the lower half of the page, and we're going to be singing them to the melody that's in the song on the top half of the page. Hopefully it's going to be a familiar enough tune for you. to You'll, you'll pick it up and and sing along. We'll get there. The choir is going to help us out. But I want you to pay attention to the words because it's talking about the words. The words talk about this, all of this story about creation and the waters of creation that continue to go throughout time. So let us stand and join together in singing this hymn. <laughs>
Please be seated as we move into a time um, of sharing the joys and the concerns of our lives with one another and then with God in prayer. After we share the joys and concerns, um, the choir will start us off with a prayer song. We'll have a spoken prayer and the Lord's Prayer, and then the choir will finish us off with a prayer song. So a few that I have brought. Um, we've received word that some more folks among us have contracted COVID. So just to remind you to keep in your, in your prayers those who are still affected uh, by COVID. There seems to be a little bit of a resurgence. We've heard that there's a new vaccine coming out. So uh, be watching for that to come out and then you know what to do. Let us continue to pray for the people of Morocco as they recover and um, continue to seek for hopefully survivors and uh, recover the remains of those that they have lost from a massive earthquake that took place last week. And for the people of Maui as they continue to recover from the wild wildfires. Um, Shell, how's Shell doing? She's home. And, and Scott is doing a wonderful job taking care of her. So prayers for Shell for healing and prayers for Scott for, yeah, just prayers for Scott. <laughs> what other joys and concerns do we bring with us today? For our friend Jody, whose husband unexpectedly passed away this week. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else this morning? Let us begin our time in prayer with song. Loving God, we rejoice that you are creating and recreating and making all things new through your merciful, compassionate spirit. We know that there are places in our lives and in, your, and in the world, oh God, that need your spirit to blow across them, to bring order out of chaos, to calm the storm to give a time of dry land upon which people can cross into new places of life. So we pray this day for those peoples whose lives are in chaos, for those who are affected by the resurgence of COVID and those who care for them. For the people of Morocco whose world literally has been shaken apart. We pray for your loving, compassionate spirit to blow across that land to bring peace and comfort and healing and the strength to rebuild. For the people of Maui, as they continue to brush aside the ashes and begin to rebuild. We give thanks for those who are reaching out to those who have been facing disasters of all kinds. 
and give thanks for their courage and their generosity. We pray for Shell and all who are being treated for illness and disease and for those who care for them. We pray for Jody and those whose worlds have turned into a time of chaos as, though, as those they love have died. Be with them in their tears and their wonder, their anger and their uncertainty. We pray for those who are carrying around personal chaos. You know their needs. You know their names. We pray for your healing, recreating spirit to blow across their lives and give them peace. We pray in the name of the one who stands up against the storms of the sea and calls out, peace, be still, as we attempt to embrace that peace and let Jesus, our Savior, bring calmness to our lives. Hear us as we bring our voices together to share the prayer that Jesus has taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we continue to move more deeply into our stewardship season, we are bracing the theme, because of you, our church changes lives. Our stewardship board has identified some areas in our ministry that we know have impacted the lives of people around us, either in our congregations or in our congregation or, or in our community. And when people talk about our church, one of the first things that they often mention is our music. We have a long history of, of a music ministry in our congregation. The design of our building um, was, was made such uh, to enhance our musical experience. We love our organ. We love our musicians. We love the music that reaches out and touches our souls. We are attempting to expand our musical repertoire so that we can have a more broad musical expression in our midst as we deal with some contemporary music, some, some chanting, meditative music in our Taizé services. As we continue to, to respond to the call um, that we are called as a congregation to change people's lives. So our stewardship message today, our video today, lifts up the music ministry of our congregation. Let us, let us watch this video and celebrate the music ministry. I think music is an integral part of uh, our church family 
and our church family's relationships with one another and with, um, with, with God. Um, I think that music reaches people in multiple ways. People that are in the choir are worshiping and presenting music, presenting their best um, for the worship service. People that are in the congregation have the opportunity to participate in congregational singing and group singing and to lift their voice in praise. So I think that the church music, church choir music, lifts people in different ways and different purposes. I think like choir members who are preparing and presenting music for the worship service on a weekly basis have a deep commitment to choral music and a deep commitment to worship and a deep commitment to God. And so they, they take their talent and use their talents to the best of their abilities to come together to present something for worship service that is a collaborative effort and it's something that one person cannot do alone. We do that as, as a group to prepare and present. Well, music's a language. Language is a part of your life. And although I'm an English speaking person, music is another big language in my life. And I'm able to communicate the way I feel. I'm able to communicate uh, thoughts and, and ideas to people through my music because I'm also a songwriter. Um, I'm able to entertain people in their joyous times, weddings, uh, anniversaries, also uh, to be able to, to, to mourn with them or celebrate life with them as I play for funerals. Um, but just able to communicate things through music that can't always be said with just uh, spoken words. So either through lyrics or through just the sounds and, uh, and common music that people are familiar with, I'm able to communicate with them and relate to them in ways that they need to because like i said music music is a language that most people speak music became my career and i'm fortunate to live in great falls and have a symphony to play in a community band to play in a great church choir to sing in um, and uh, i have to say when i joined the church choir here uh, singing had not been the highest part of my list but uh, I quickly realized that uh, there were some really good singers at this church and, and so it was very fun to be with them and uh, it became kind of a family within a family here at the church, which I very much appreciate. Started Handbells in 1986. I've been the only director so far. I have an assistant director, Karen Spencer, uh, which I appreciate very much. We've attended Big Sky Handbell Festival. We've performed. I think we've added to our musical offerings at our church because of it. I think Handbells expands our possibilities for people that we're around. So, you know, I got, I actually started church here in the midst of the COVID pan pandemic. And so there wasn't a lot of music participation going on in person. And so our pastor here uh, invited me to participate in virtual services. And so I was able to lead some of the the hymn singing and the chorus singing through uh, virtual services that we had during COVID pandemic. And then that gradually led into uh, working with uh, playing the piano during some services and uh, with uh, collaboration with some other worshipers at our church, we've, we've incorporated three or four uh, contemporary type services into our worship during the year just to branch out and, and allow people to experience worship in something that's a little different than the traditional where we do more contemporary hymns or contemporary courses and um, have a kind of a uh, praise team instead of a choir and we've even tried to incorporate drums and guitars into it and I think as time goes on and as people get more comfortable with that we'll be able to involve more people that are interested in the contemporary music portion of worship. Music is the creative side of the brain. Uh, right brain, left brain was a big thing in education. And people that develop the creative side of the brain end up being exceedingly successful in almost everything they do. People that uh, they are creative, which uh, spurring that uh, creativity is a, a wonderful thing. And when you see it come out in a student or a group or what they can accomplish. Um, it's very exciting and it, it sets people up for success. 
First Congregational United Church of Christ has a history in our community of providing excellent music and excellent worship experiences. And it's my goal and hope that we are able to continue that and that we have been good stewards of our time and talents. The gifts we offer touch and change lives in ways that we may never fully understand. And that's just how the Holy Spirit works, by taking what we give and transform it into love, compassion, food for body and soul, and music raised to the Creator. So as we give today, may we do so in love, in prayer, in joy, in thanksgiving, and with generosity. Let us present this morning's offering.
Please join with me in the spirit of prayer. O oh God, the source of all good things, we bring to you our gifts. Enable us with our earthly things to give you the love of our hearts and the service of our lives. Through Jesus Christ, your beloved, our Savior. Amen. And let us close in, as we continue to celebrate the music in our midst with hymn number 561, when in our music God is glorified. Now, my friends, let us go forth into life and into the world knowing that God goes before us to make some creation, to make some order out of chaos, to help us through. And now may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Go in peace and please be seated for the postlude.